Our message is not only scandalous, it's unbelievable. I want you to know that. It is an unbelievable message. Pliny the Younger writes, after examining the beliefs of two Christian slave girls under torture, he says, I discovered nothing but a perverse and extravagant superstition. In the dialogue, Octavius by Minucius Felix, he derides the Christian saying, their ceremonies center on a man put to death for his crime and on the fatal wood of the cross. He goes on to say that Christians put forward sick delusions, a senseless and crazy superstition. In Origen's work, Contra Celsus, Celsus declares, what drunken old woman telling stories would not be ashamed of uttering such preposterous things. Go to verse 23. Verse 23, we'll start there. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, he said that back in verse 9. That's a distinguishing element. Not everybody has ears to hear. And what distinguishes you? You have ears to hear. What happened at your salvation was the Lord opened your spiritual ears, right? And all of a sudden, the Word of God took on new meaning and, and you began to hunger for it and long for it like a baby desires milk, as Peter puts it. We must be careful to shun every temptation to conform our gospel to the trends of the day or the desires of carnal men. To the wind with what the world thinks about us, we are not to seek the honor of earth, but the honors of heaven. Look at what's being done in evangelicalism. Just open your eyes and look at what's being done. Find out about the culture. Find out about the culture. Find out about the culture. Do everything you can. Look, stop worrying about the culture. Find out about God. Find out about Scripture. Find out what God says in the Bible and just do it. Do what he says, because it's a lot easier to get a tattoo on your arm. It's a lot easier to look cool. It's a lot easier to open up a coffee shop than it is to fast for two weeks till the power of God falls down on a place or study scripture eight hours a day until you think your brain is going to melt. But that's what men of God do. That's why we're called men of God. We love people, but we know the best way to help people is to spend most of our time with God so that when we walk out among the people, we have something to say to them. Not the latest poll says this. In a sense, the gospel is so far-fetched that its spread throughout the Roman Empire is proof of its supernatural nature. He was born under questionable circumstances to a poor family in one of the most despised regions of the Roman Empire. And yet the gospel claimed that he was the eternal son of God who was conceived of the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin. He was a carpenter by trade, an itinerant religious teacher with no official training. And yet the gospel claims that he surpassed the combined wisdom of the Greek philosopher and the Roman sages of antiquity. He was poor and had no place to lay his head. And yet the gospel claims that for three years he fed thousands by a word, healed every manner of illness among men and even raised the dead. He was crucified outside of Jerusalem as a blasphemer and an enemy of the state. And yet the gospel claims that his death was the pivotal event in all of human history and the only means of salvation from sin and reconciliation to God. He was placed in a borrowed tomb. Yet the gospel claims that on the third day he arose from the dead and presented himself to many of his followers. And 40 days later ascended up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Thus the gospel claims that a poor Jewish carpenter who was rejected as a lunatic and a blasphemer by his own people and crucified by the state is now the savior of the world, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And at his name, every knee will bow, including Caesar's. Now, do you have any idea how impossible it is for anyone in Paul's time to believe this message? It is impossible. 
Who could have ever believed such a message except by the power of God? The gospel would have never made its way out of Jerusalem, let alone the Roman Empire, and into every nation of the world except that God had ordained to work through it. The message would have died at its birth had it depended upon the organizational abilities, eloquence, or apologetic powers of its preachers. Now this truth brings both encouragement and warning to those of us who preach the gospel. First, it is an encouragement to know that the simple, faithful proclamation of the gospel will ensure its continued advance in the world. Secondly, it is a warning to us that we not succumb to the lie that we can advance the gospel through brilliance, eloquence, or clever church growth strategies. Such things have no power to bring about the impossible conversion of men. This giant of a man walked in and he sat down on the front row, the saddest human being I've ever seen, about 65 years old, but just, I mean, huge. And I just started preaching the gospel. There were only about 15 people in there, just preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel. When I finished, I walked down from the pulpit and I said, sir, what's wrong with you? And he looked at me, pulled out a manila envelope and pulled out an x-ray and he handed it to me. It me meant nothing to me. He said, I just came from a doctor. Tears started coming down his his face. He said, I just came from a doctor. He told me I had three weeks to live. He said, I've worked in the outback all my life on a working cattle ranch. You can't get there except by a float plane or ride over the mountain on a horse. He goes, I'm not afraid of anything. I've never been afraid of anything. He said, I know there's a God. He said, one time I heard somebody talk about some guy named Jesus. And all I know is I'm going to die and I'm afraid. And I said, sir, you heard the message. Did you understand it? And he said, I understood it. Of course, I, uh, uh, anyone could have understood it. And then he said this. He said, but is that it? What would most evangelists in America have done at that moment? Sir, would you like to pray and receive right. Jesus? Right. I said, sir, this is where it's going to be. I'm supposed to leave tomorrow. I'll cancel my plane. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to sit down with the scriptures and we're going to go over them until either you're converted and I go home or you die and go to hell. And we sat down with those scriptures. What am I to do? Can I create the world? Because that's what conversion is. God speaks into darkness and there is light. It parallels the very creation of the universe. I don't have that power, but faithfully ministering the Word of God. So we just started going over promise after promise after promise. And then I would pray. I would explain things to him. We'd go on. We're going on into the night. And then we came back finally. And I said, sir, read John 3.16. And I'll never forget that Bible was on his legs like this and his big old hands were down there. And, and he goes, well, did we, you know, didn't we, we read that. And I said, I know we read it. I said, just read John 3, 16 again. And after hours, he, he, he went like this and I'll never forget. He looked down there and he said, okay, well, for God so loved the world. And then all of a sudden he goes, I have eternal life. I believe. I see. He died for me. I am saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. And I said, I said, how do you know you're saved? He said, haven't you ever read this verse before? <laughs> That's what we call the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit.